We have a number of texts we'll be considering today as the, the text for the message is from Hebrews chapter 6. First, we have two texts, since our text we're looking at today brings together uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. It's in Genesis 14 where we see that meeting of these two great men of the Old Testament era. So our first text will be Genesis 14, 17 through 24. Now remember, the lot was snatched by a number of kings that then engaged in a battle. And after that battle was over, uh, Abraham, missing Lot, uh, got together his group of Navy SEALs and his household, his 300 Spartans, and went out and took care of business, caught them off guards, and got Lot, well, of some possessions and spoil, and returned. And this is where we find them. Verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Shedor, Shed Orleomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom and said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abram rich. I'll take nothing but what the young men have earned, eaten, and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anur, Eshcol, and Mamre take their share. Now turning to Genesis 22, we have the famous text of Abraham being called of God to sacrifice his son Isaac upon Mount Moriah. We're going to intercept into the center of this at verses 15 through 18. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring, or, or the word is also rightly translated seed. I'll multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Now for the text today, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, the text for today is verses 13 through 20, but I'm going to begin reading in verse 9, Hebrews 6, 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire that each one of you will show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. 
So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Heavenly Father, we do pray that this very rich and profound text would not remain locked to our vision or our hearts, but that your Holy Spirit would open up our minds and hearts to draw great nourishment, the nourishment of the fidelity of the grace of God to our souls in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> The author of the Hebrews tells us at the end of his book that his book was a word of encouragement or a word of exhortation. That word can, has a little bit of elasticity of meaning. But it's a word to encourage faith. It's a word to encourage faith. It's a word to stimulate and provoke, stir up faith. And that's why he repeatedly calls them to diligence and to not be sluggish in responding to these spiritual matters that are set before them. And he encourages them in their diligence to hold fast. And then, as he says in verse 8, we have strong encouragement to hold fast to Christ and to not drift, as he warns in chapter 2. He wants us to understand that we have reason for confidence as heirs of the Abrahamic covenant promise, which are mediated to us by the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, he wants us to get fixed. Fixed on things above. Where Jesus Christ, your high priest, secures you. Fixed on things above and not on the things of earth where there is turmoil and instability and stress and challenges to that faith. And he encourages us, particularly in this text, with the fact that we have a sure and steadfast anchor for our souls, for our inside. And that sure and steadfast anchor is Jesus. Jesus, he has gone there for us and he returns to us with bread and wine to bind us to himself. So I provided an outline of today's sermon, I broke it into three parts. The first part is dealing with Genesis chapter 14. That text where Abraham and Melchizedek meet. Because our text joins together Abraham and Melchizedek, doesn't it? So Abraham could not let Lot go. And if you know Lot... Uh, he probably should, should. Forget you. <laughs> I give up on you. <laughs> but he wouldn't do it. So when he got snatched by these kings and the stir of things, Abraham went and got him back. By him and his 300 plus servants who were trained in battle of that time. I called them the Navy SEALs or the Spartan 300 because they went and took care of business. They caught him off guard. These are trained men versus trained men, but Abraham's men caught him off guard. They were even more trained. 
But, but in retrieving Lot, he had stirred up a hornet's nest. Payback it was probably not far into the future. He had an earthly situation of turmoil on his hands, of suspicion. When are they going to come? The world was against Abraham. And so the king of righteousness comes to pay him a visit. He's the king of righteousness. He's from Salem, from Shalom, probably short for Jerusalem, peace. He comes to bring peace who is greater than Abraham's turmoil at that time. And he blesses him. He blesses Abraham by God Most High. And he confirms God's covenant relationship with him. This high priest, this Melchizedek, who names means king of righteousness, he confirms it with a meal of bread and wine that Abraham understood, represented the heavenly city where he stood with God's sure blessing. Such overwhelming comfort and and encouragement had brought out of Abraham's heart a reciprocal response, a raised hand. Abraham is swearing allegiance to the God who by way of oath had reached him. Abraham's returning, a response of faith to this God, my God, to your hope, my hope, this land, my land. Abraham was saying, look, I know God has my back. I have the vault of heaven at my back. And so Abraham had to flee. He had to flee to this heavenly city this city of refuge by way of the king of righteousness, Melchizedek. He had a safe place in the city of peace as Melchizedek brought him into that refuge. And bread and wine. Bread and wine from out of that city, from Melchizedek, was the confirmation of God's oath a confirmation of God's oath to Abraham that Abraham heartily received. It was a word from heaven coupled with an oath. See, that was God's pattern in dealing with Abraham. It didn't happen just once. It happened repeatedly. This dual assurance, this dual assurance of being initiated into, then nourished by God for the faith of Abraham to rise up and raise his hand in allegiance to his God, to that higher order, to the great King of heaven. And so God promises, plus God swears an oath on top of it to confirm that promise. And that brings us to God's oath that we, that we read about in Hebrews chapter 6. God's oath, God's word, God's oath. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. 
See, the culminating pattern of God's covenant dealings with Abraham comes in chapter 22, where again an oath is brought to Abraham. Remember verse 17? By oath, he swears, indeed, I will bless you. I will multiply you. That's just a condensed way of saying everything else he's been saying right, of promising Abraham. The word promised with an oath. God told Abraham, go sacrifice Isaac, the promised seed, up on the mount of the Lord. And Hebrews 7, 11 certifies, Hebrews 11, it certifies that God believed, I'm sorry, that Abraham believed that God would raise Isaac up after he killed him. That's Hebrews 11. Um, the only way we know that is when it says, as Abraham considered what he was about to do, he looked ahead and he was three days off. Now apparently that was the clue to the author to the Hebrews. That's resurrection, three days. Maybe he picked up on something else. But he says that Abraham believed that if he killed his own son, because it's according to God's command, he would have to raise him up because of God's promise and oath to him. But Abraham was stopped in midstream. Stopped by the Lord Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord, and provided a ram for the burnt offering in Isaac's place. And then God swears to the promise. Indeed, surely. Surely, indeed. I swear, indeed. Definitely. I will bless, I will multiply, etc., as it stated in Genesis 22. And why did God say, indeed, I will? Why does he swear this time and say, indeed, I will? Why? He says, because. You've obeyed me. That's why. Because you've done this and have not held your son, your only son. Now we know that Abraham's son, when he is raised from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, is also Melchizedek. <laughs> he is Isaac raised who as raised brings bread and wine from heaven to confirm the promise to the vast seed of Abraham. And so we have this twofold immutable guarantee of God of word and promise and the confirmation of this oath. Now that very formula of word and oath, promise and oath, promise and God swearing, is earlier very dramatically displayed in Genesis chapter 15. Now, we, we don't have time to stop and read Genesis 15, but you know it, right? You know it. The word of the Lord came to, came to Abraham, look, Abraham, uh, your seed will be like the stars of the heavens, right? And uh, said to Abraham, listen to the Lord's word. He believed it. And it was counted to him for righteousness. But then we see just a little fissure in Abraham's faith. A little crack in his confidence. And he comes back, he says, How will I know this? Now, if I was God, I would have said, Because I just told you, dummy. But he didn't, because God was merciful. God knew Abraham was dust. And when that little fissure in that faith, that little crack in his confidence appeared, what did God do? God brought it on. God said, okay, here's how you're going to know. So he symbolically, God symbolically takes the oath of confirmation. The burning torch passing between the separated animal pieces. 
As if God is saying to him, here's the oath of confirmation. If I don't keep my word, may I be cut in half like these animals. May God himself die as these animals are dead. There's the oath of confirmation. Symbolically portrayed for us. For Abraham to know and to be confirmed and confident in his faith before God. Now, what is it that God's taking an oath to? Well, God's taking an oath of self maldiction guaranteeing to bless sinners whom His justice must curse. God Himself backs Himself into a corner. An impossible situation. Because something's got to break. Either God must violate his promise and his oath by following his justice and cursing sinners as they deserve, or he keeps his promise and violates his justice and doesn't curse sinners that deserve it. Now that's the deal. That's the deal with the, with, with the covenant with Abraham and the oath to follow the, the very existence of I am is on the line. And so you have this very dark and mysterious uh, context in which Abraham is, 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 is almost floating in his own mind in darkness about what it all means in this disturbing uh, covenant that God enters into of self-maldiction with Abraham. How, how can that be? How can it happen? How can both sides of the equation exist when each cancels out the other? Well, the answer to these promises to Abraham is typologically answered in chapter 22. Abraham's obedience in chapter 22, sacrificing his son. Abraham's action uh, points to God's action in his son made flesh, who is according to the seed of Abraham. So that the very curse, the very just administration of the curse and of God's judgment for, break, for being lawbreakers and sinners, Christ bore. God's justice for sin is satisfied in Christ's suffering and death when the Father delivered him up for us all. So that God might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. God can keep his promise to save the seed of Abraham only because his son, his only son, has borne the curse for them, freeing God to bring them to heaven, the promised land. And so, the author of the Hebrews wants us to understand here that we have before us two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. First, he said it. There's no wiggle room for God to lie on that. Then he follows it up with an oath of self maldiction which even increases it, as if God needed to do that. But he doesn't for our weak and stammering fractured faith. And the author to the Hebrews wants us to know here, because of it, we have a very strong encouragement. We have a strong encouragement. And that is the big point of Hebrews, isn't it? This encouragement. Now he says you have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope of heaven to hold fast to the hope of eternal life. To hold fast to the hope of being heirs of an unshakable kingdom of righteousness and of holiness where God dwells through Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. We have that hope, you see. Behind the veil, he goes on to say, it's not just a hope out there. 
as a hope up here. But we have access to. So in verse 18 through verse 20, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this, that is the hope, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now note this passage and note who is the target of this passage. Note it. Note who it is. It's the object of his effort the author of the Hebrews in his edification, who he's trying to benefit here by what he's saying. Verse 17, he's speaking to the heirs of the promise. If you're a believer in Christ, that's you. Verse 18, we who have fled for refuge is set before us. Verse 18. Verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor. Verse 20, Christ has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. See what he's doing? He's wanting to strengthen you, the church, the assembly gathered around Christ on Mount Zion. Verse 18, so that, so that, that means in order that, it's the hina in the Greek. It's a clue of here's the purpose, here's the reason why. In order that. And then he says, by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible God to lie. We who have fled for refuge, what? We, what? Might have strong encouragement to hold fast. See, the author of the Hebrews, he gets it. He knows there's many forces at work to pry your hands off of Christ and his worship. He knows there's many forces that want to separate you from the community gathered to Christ and worship because you separated from the community that Christ calls in worship. You are separated from Christ. Christ calls you to Himself in worship, through worship. Covenantal call to the covenantal community. And there are many forces at work to get you to drift. And one of the biggest of all those forces that would get you to drift is the deceit of the devil in discouragement. That's why he's giving you encouragement. Discouragement. I, I'm, I'm too big of a sinner. I'm too frequent of a sinner. I'm a repeat def offender. I'm too dualistic. My hypocrisy knows no bounds for Jesus to possibly save and put back together. And so the author to the Hebrews, you say, he uh, says, I'm seeking to set before you strong encouragement of a covenantal nature in word and in oath, in word and sacrament, to hold fast we who have fled for refuge. It's like Abraham. He went out and killed a bunch of guys. <laughs> he was fleeing for refuge. Down comes Melchizedek. Come to the right place. There's bread and wine from the city of refuge above. And him and his little band of reckless Navy SEALs, who did rescue a lot, by the way, are encouraged. 
and so too we who have fled for refuge. See what that's echoing? That's echoing the cities of refuge. The Old Testament. You accidentally killed a guy. You didn't really mean it, but it happened. And maybe you were careless. What do you do? Run! <laughs> Run! To the city of refuge! Who is on your tail will be one of the relatives of the man you just killed. And the author of the Hebrews, you see, is taking that because he knows we're guilty. We knew guilt and retribution are on our heels, nipping away like hound dogs. He knows that's us. Run to the city of refuge. Run to refuge in Christ. Because if you let go, there's nowhere to go. There's no safety. You will be adrift, caught in strong currents of a dark and ruthless storming sea from which there'll be no recovery. He knows that. They'll put on your tombstone, lost at sea. And so he brings to you and to me God's own word confirmed by oath of this hope of heaven. A hope that's not merely beyond waiting in the future, but a hope that is above. And not merely above, but a hope that's come down to you in word and sacrament, in promise and in oath. That is what he brings of encouragement. We have this hope, verse 19, as he says, as an anchor. A sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Now, you can't get this in the English. Well, I'll just go ahead and share it. But in the Greek, it stands out. Because he says what we have, he, have, he says we have a sure, steadfast, entering anchor of the soul. We don't quite get that in English. But he's building it up, you see. It's sure. It's steadfast. It's confirmed. It's confirmed. It's sure. God says it. It's confirmed. An oath. A sacrament. To go with it. And it's entering. It's an entering hope. It's an anchor for the soul. You see, the anchor surpasses all the surrounding instability. All the harshness of the environment that you're in. Regardless of how high the waves rise. No matter how hard the winds blow. No matter how threatening the situation is, the anchor sustains you. So listen. Listen, you storm-tossed, slipping, sliding, stumbling, inconsistent, sinning believer. Listen. You have an anchor. The world outside of your soul, stormy sea. But see what he says? Not that you just have an anchor, right? You have an anchor for your soul. Can he bring it home anymore? Can he get inside of you anymore? An anchor for your soul, you on the inside there, your soul. Where the storm rages even more. Give an anchor. And the world and your soul, run here, run there, run anywhere. No. Run like the little red hen. Run like the little red hen with her head chopped off. You know, 
chicken running around like their head chopped off, right? You've heard the saying. Run anywhere. Drop your anchor of stability anywhere and cling for dear life. Row your little dinghy in the violent ocean of life with one oar in the sea of madness. But whatever you do, don't drop your anchor on God's covenant word and oath. That's why the author, that's why you need the author of the Hebrews. <laughs> Your own heart in this world will not lead you where you need to go. <laughs> but praise God, you have it here. Drop your anchor in God's covenant word and oath in Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's where. Say no to all these tempting and vacuous voices, whether it be without or within, and by faith set your face to the city above. Grip your fist to the hope above. Drop your anchor behind the curtain above where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, your behalf. Because he's become a high priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. Praise God. The tension of how can a holy God possibly save sinners is relieved here in Christ. The son of Abraham. The Son of God, Jesus, has made the sacrifice. And he has gone on ahead to heaven. And he's returned with bread and wine to confirm his word to you. You see, the promises to Abraham and his vast seed are bound up in Abraham's son. The singular Seed, who by death, like Isaac on Mount Moriah, but by resurrection and habitation in the heavenly shalom, is Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace. The king who's not only coming back for us in the future, but that very one and same King who already comes back to us serving bread and wine. He comes today. He comes to you clothed in word and sacrament that you might have strong encouragement to receive him and to gratefully raise your right hand. To him. Let us pray. I am compelled to finish with this. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Now let us pray.